Welcome to Renegade Inc. The death of a prominent Islamic State leader prompts us to ask fundamental questions about the so-called war on terror. When we see terror groups mobilising, there is often that jarring moment when we all wonder, how is it possible with all the global military might, terrorism can still prosper? More puzzling is how these terrorist groups buy arms, vehicles and ammunition to wage their jihad. Do they simply steal oil and sell it on the international markets? Or is there something else at play that we should all know about if we are to defeat these hate-filled mercenaries? We went to Coconomics, the leading economics festival in Norway, to talk to the former Norwegian ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Carl Schwarzweibe, and the terrorism expert Loretta Napoleone to work out who really funds Terror Inc. Loretta, to start with you, uh, when people see uh, these horrific terror uh, atrocities across the world, and then we see news pictures somewhere uh, in the Middle East often uh, of brand new cars, equipment, people think, how on earth are these people, these terrorists, getting money? Who's funding them? And what's the reason behind them being funded? Can you answer that? Oh, this is what is called um, state sponsor of terrorism, which is a classic model of financing. Uh, during the Cold War, the former Soviet Union and the United States uh, were fighting uh, war by proxy along the periphery of the sphere of influence uh, by fully funding uh, armed organization. So right. the same thing is happening today. So there's nothing the new in this. It's just in a different no. guise and dare I say it, a bit more brutal, a lot more brutal. Brutality depends. <laughs> but yes, well, it depends maybe, which bit of history you look yes, at. Yes, right. depends which part of history, but uh, terrorism is always brutal. So we're more specific then. Islamic state, who's funding them? Why are they funding them? And what's their ultimate objective? Well, the Islamic State uh, was self-funded, basically. When they created the state, the caliphate, uh, they could sustain themselves. It was a nation, so they raised taxes, uh, royalties uh, for people that exploited the resources which were controlled by the state. But in order to get there, they were part of the war by proxy in Syria and they were bankrolled by the Gulf state, in particular by Saudi Arabia. So they were bankrolled by Saudi Arabia specifically or all Gulf states? Oh, specifically by Saudi Arabia, but you never know exactly who the sponsor are. You have different uh, players, uh, even private people, of course. Uh, and they were able to attract a lot of money because they were very good. They were better than any other group. Why were they very good? Tell us their strategy. Well, they were good because um, they were composed by two groups of people. Uh, one were the jihadists coming from the al zarqawi group, which had fought in Iraq. And the other group uh, were the former top-ranking officers uh, of Saddam Hussein. So they knew how to fight better than anybody else. And the other thing that they did, they fought against the other groups in order to establish themselves as the strongest, the sole controlling group of that territory. And then once they've conquered land, which might be rich pasture land, i.e. agricultural land, uh, water is also a valuable resource, and of course oil, what do they do once that has been commandeered, once that land's been taken? What happens? Well, what they did uh, was establish a state. So they gave the administration of that land, so we're talking about also villages, and towns to the local community. So to the tribal leader, they establish a very strong relationship with the tribal leader in the territory that they conquer. And in that way, they also achieve consensus. And they acted as a state. So they fixed the infrastructure, they guaranteed uh, law and order, they guaranteed also national security. So the foreign fighters, they were fighting to protect the territory in reality they were acting as an army in any state, nation state. That's the responsibility of national security. Don't forget, we're talking about the Sunni population and the Islamic State, of course, they were Sunni, while the Assad regime 
was a Shia. Mm -hmm. So the Sunni had been discriminated against uh, for a very long time. So that's already you know, a step in the right direction for the tribal leaders. But yes, this is a population which had been plagued by war for a very long time, who had been repressed by the regime of Assad, but also they have been facing warlords, armed gangs. So the, the simple fact that there is an authority that re-establish law and order is already welcome by people. They mm. feel more secure, and yet they want to pay taxes for that. If this is the price to pay, it's not such a big price. And when it comes to Saudi Arabia bankrolling uh, Islamic State initially, what did they want to achieve by doing that? The Saudis uh, didn't want the regime of Assad to stay in place. Now, of course, the Saudis are Sunnis. Assad was a Shia. Assad uh, was allied with Iran. Uh, the Iranians had access, uh, it's fundamental, the access uh, to the Mediterranean via Assad. So there were lots going on, and this is why they decided to bankroll uh, the so-called insurgency, which in reality was the jihadists fighting to establish a different kind of regime. Carl, when it comes to Saudi Arabia funding all this terror and proxy wars around the Middle East, what is the official line and the unofficial line when it comes to talking to the family, if you like? Do they acknowledge that they've funded any of this? Do they ever trumpet that and say, actually, this is a triumph? Or is it kept very under the carpet? Well, the funding of the Islamic State was indeed uh, kept very much under the carpet. It was done uh, mostly by, uh, as far as I can understand, uh, princes with their private accounts and, and uh, business people with the resources uh, they needed. Uh, the official uh, government line in uh, Riyadh was, of course, that uh, Islamic State was uh, a deviation from the Islamic path. They were not part of Islam and that they didn't belong in the Sunni family. That was the official line. There was a lot of money coming out of Riyadh uh, in spite of this official line. And I believe that was mostly private money, which is, of course, very difficult to control. And the tradition in that area is uh, zero transparency to start with. So it was very difficult to see the flows of money into the area, where it came from and where it went. And from your point of view, having been in Saudi Arabia uh, for quite some time, you're a Norwegian ambassador to that country. What is in the mind of that administration when they are funding all these proxy wars? What do they really want to get out of it? Well, there is a number of, of wars uh, going on. You have the war against Yemen, which is not really a proxy war. It is an, a number of allied countries uh, led by Saudi Arabia which is waging war against uh, Yemen, which is a great humanitarian disaster. Mm. You have the blockade of Qatar, you have the support to Bahrain, the Royal House. And then again, you have the Iraq, of course, which is, uh, as you rightly say, uh, proxy wars. What they hope to gain is basically uh, support their power to keep the Royal House in, in a position of power in Saudi Arabia. And with the position of power comes, of course, an immense income. So this is really about power and money, which is... Not unusual in politics. <laughs> you surprise me. And when you look at the conflicts, these are conflicts which have been going on for tens, hundreds, even thousands of years. If you look at the conflict between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, it is uh, basically a conflict between Sunni and Shia, of course, but even more so a conflict between Arabs and Persians, which has been going on since Alexander the Great and before that. Mm -hmm. So these are really old conflicts, and now we just see the repetition of these conflicts. Of course, the states of Saudi Arabia, they were created by, by families. Iran was created by emperors, but many other states are just a drawing board states. And that, of course, will create conflicts as well. When you have a border which just cuts through, maybe orders uh, areas of the same ethnicity, same culture, you just make a line through it. And this happened after the First World War. So you also have the results of that situation. You know, you have so many conflict lines now that I, I don't think anyone has the ultimate goal other than to shore up their own power, to stay in power and to maximize their income. In the West, we often hear uh, this phrase, the war on terror. Right. In fact, it's across the news. When we talk about the war on terror, we don't often talk about Saudi Arabia. In fact, Saudi Arabia, an ally to the West, uh, or certainly uh, mm -hmm. we're friendly towards. Why is that? Well, the war on terror is um, a creation of uh, Bush. Uh, we never, actually, in terrorism, never 
talk about war on terror because by saying war, you're automatically establish the legitimacy of the terrorist not to be considered a crime, but to be considered a soldier. You don't fight wars with criminals. You fight wars with enemies. I mean, this is a really important concept in terrorism because they always will come to you and say, we are not terrorists. You call us terrorists. We are freedom fighters. We are soldiers. We're fighting you because you are doing something very bad. Therefore, we do not recognize your legitimacy. So that sentence was already a very confusing sentence. Uh, and everybody was working on terrorism at that time was shocked that he used that word. Now, of course, the reason why he did it is because the US had already a plan to invade Iraq. So they had to go to war. The Saudis, of course, were very much allies at the time because they didn't want to have Saddam Hussein getting on their border, coming through Kuwait. So, it was all an international relationship kind of you know, game that was put after 9-11. The truth is that the majority of the hijackers of 9-11 were from Saudi Arabia. Osama bin Laden was a Saudi. I mean, the whole operation was plotted, funded, and planned by, you know, Saudi Forces. Now, of course, you know, these people uh, were presented to the world as people that had nothing to do with the Saudi regime. But we know that there were princes. We know there were, you know, people very close to the Saudi royal family. When, when we're talking about international relations, though, reading your book, going back to 1944, uh, just talk about that relationship uh, in the Suez Canal that sprung really out of convenience. But that one exchange and the relationship between the US and Saudi Arabia has changed things dramatically in the course of modern history. Isn't it? it was the British who had the upper hand in Saudi Arabia. They helped the Royal House of Saudi Arabia in the First World War to fight the Turkish. But the Saudis used the money to fight their rivals so they could establish their state, their kingdom. So it's actually a British project, maybe not consciously, but that's how it happened. But of course, the uh, British power was waning, and then, then the Americans came in. They were the ones who found the oil in Saudi Arabia in the 1930s. They were the ones who produced it, and they were the ones who wanted it brought to America. So they uh, created this alliance with the uh, Saudis in 1944, as you rightly mentioned, on the Suez Canal. Franklin Roosevelt met with King Ibn Saud. And uh, this alliance means that the Saudis will supply the oil under any circumstances, and the Americans will provide the security for the production and transport of that oil. And that alliance, which is now 80 years old almost, is still valid, which we just saw in the case of uh, Khashoggi in Istanbul, that the alliance was very much there, that the Americans kept a low profile. The president doubted the, the, the version of, of the murder. So uh, this alliance uh, sticks and it it's will stay. Is that not hypocrisy in, in the highest? I wouldn't say hypocrisy on, only, but uh, you have to protect your own interests. Uh, and of course, for the United States and for the West, uh, oil is fundamental. And Saudi Arabia is the largest producer in the world. Uh, the price that we're paying is that the Saudis uh, do certain things uh, they are absolutely inconceivable in uh, Western societies, in democracies, but we all keep quiet. Carl, in your book, uh, Land of Terror, you identify Wahhabism as a ideology uh, and a movement in Saudi Arabia that uh, is a source of a lot of the problems uh, that we see uh, today. Just explain what that ideology is for us. Well, that's a very big question, but uh, basically... <laughs> I'll just do it, it in about uh, 30 yes. seconds if you can, <laughs> yeah. thanks. It is an ideology which came out of the 
Arabian Desert about 300 years ago in the early 1700s. There was this uh, preacher of a fire and uh, hell and evil who said that we have to reform Islam, we have to go back to the basics. And the way he went back to the basics is saying that all the traditions, all the improvements or whatever, which have been made to Islam in those last 1,100 years, yeah. they are illegal. They are to be abolished. So you've got to scrap everything. Yes, you know, scrap everything. And that's okay. But the trouble is, he said that those who don't agree with me, they are unbelievers. And what happens to them? Unfortunately, they have a very short lifespan. <laughs> right, so they get scrapped <laughs> yes, as well. Yes. <laughs> He's got a clear agenda. This so, so basically, it is a, a version of Islam which takes the militant parts, the more violent parts, and uses it as a mainstream message in Islam, as opposed to, let's say, Ahmadiyya Islam, Sufi Islam, which are more, much more peaceful variations of Islam. And he takes this very violent part and says, this is Islam. If you don't believe me, you're an unbeliever. That's the basic message. And also, if you don't believe me, I will hate you. So it is, I think we can say, an ideology of hate against unbelievers. And from hate, of course, you can go very easily to terrorism. Yeah. So the Saudis are not actually promoting terrorism. I wouldn't say that. But they are promoting hate in Islam to make Islam more hateful towards other religions and towards other versions of Islam. And for the purpose of this program, they're also funding Wahhabism and, and the ideology. Is that true? Yes, they have been, especially since uh, 1973, since the oil price hike, they suddenly had the resources to uh, do a lot of funding. And after 1980, because of certain internal developments, this funding was increased uh, exponentially. And they have been building thousands of mosques, religious schools, sending thousands of preachers, sending millions of poisonous Quran uh, translations all over the world. It's really a propaganda effort. When it comes to uh, stopping that funding, it's incredibly difficult because in liberal democracies, we don't ask for total transparency where money has come from. And even if we did, it's quite easy to get cash into people's hands to you know, build a madrasa, build a mosque, or um, employ a hate preacher. How do you go about stopping that ideology spreading? Well, for a start, the, the funding um, is not necessarily legal. I mean, this is a country that wants to promote uh, the building of schools uh, or religious uh, places for uh, its own people, meaning you know, the Muslims. So from that point of view, it's really very, very difficult to stop it. Uh, what are you going to say? You're going to say, no, you know, Muslim cannot go to mosque. It's impossible. Meaning we are democracies based upon tolerance. We tolerate any kind of religion, including people that do not have any religion. And I don't think we should uh, depart from that. That's a great conquest. If we fight radicalization, if we convince people that this kind of message uh, is actually a message of hate, then I think, you know, we can start doing something. Politicians like to say, we need more legislation. We need more rules because it's an easy way out from the position where you, the citizen, could say, in 19 years, uh, you haven't done anything. By now, we should be over the shock of 9-11. Okay, it was uh, psychologically for the Western world, um, watching live uh, what happened was deeply deeply traumatic, which made possible for politicians to pass a certain kind of legislations that in normal time would never even been discussed. So now we should be over that shock. It's a long time. So now it's time to look at what has happened. The war on terror, invasion of Afghanistan, situation in Afghanistan, a complete disaster. Uh, invasion um, of Iraq, a situation in Iraq, uh, even worse. Destabilization of the entire Middle East. Why do you think we have uh, all these migrants coming? Why do you think we're having all these problems? These are the consequences of our policies. I think it's time that we actually take a big breath and look back and say, we made this and this mistake, so let's rectify these mistakes. If we don't do that, uh, it's going to get to a point uh, in which we could have social unrest at a certain point. Which we're already seeing in various places across Europe. So, Carl, really it comes to the social contract here, because what we're saying is that unless we um, rethink this, give people economic opportunity, 
uh, and not push them towards these radical messages, then actually uh, it's a busted flush. But more important, unless we review the partnerships, the relationships and those business deals that allow, for instance, Saudi Arabia to uh, continue in the way that they're going, then this is an endless war. Well, this alliance with the United States is, is very strong. And uh, we have the partnership with the Americans, Norway, for example, with, with NATO. So we are sort of tied up with this alliance with the Saudis. It's very difficult to do anything about the Saudi policy. Uh, and also we have uh, armaments exporters uh, who are very much interested in mm. keeping the status quo. You know, they sell a lot of uh, planes and tanks and guns to to Saudi Arabia. Actually, they were the biggest uh, weapons customer in the world, I think, in 2017, 17, was it not? Yeah. So they all want to keep this going, this uh, situation. It's, it's very hard to get a political acceptance for tightening the screw on Saudi Arabia. And as for their policy, when the Saudi ambassador came to Norway for the first time in 2011, his one instruction was to build more mosques. And they would finance that, you know, they would finance these mosques. And uh, when you as say, you say, there's nothing illegal about that. Right, of course. Cool. And when you say one instruction, you mean there was just one instruction? I mean, we must have had a few instructions, right? Well, of course, he had to take care of Saudi interests in general, but this was from the from the king. You from know. a priority point of view? Yes, for priority, it was priority number one, two, three, and four or five. Mm -hmm. I've learned more in this exchange than I have in months, years with the mainstream media. What's their role? Because it seems to me if the public do understand what's really going on, understand how the deal is structured, who's protecting who, where the money's coming from, what the resources are being used for, then you'd start to have very different uh, conversations with politicians. So is the media complicit? And if so, why? Or are they just inept? After 9-11, the policy that was pursued by the US and you know, the Allies was a policy of justification or military intervention. In order to do that, they had to have their own experts. The people will tell you, yes, of course, we have to intervene. We are the good guys and they are the bad guys. And then there are people that will tell you, well, actually, no, you know, if we intervene, we're going to make a situation even worse. In reality, there isn't a division between bad guys uh, and good guys because right. Osama bin Laden was bankrolled by our own allies. He was actually working for us uh, at the time in which he was handling the Mujahideen uh, in Afghanistan when we were fighting the Soviets. So the media listened to, of course, the advisors uh, of you know, the various uh, governments that they wanted to intervene. Why did he do that? Basically, he did it because there was sensationalism. It's great. It's absolutely great to present a tragedy like 9-11, visually you know, unbelievable, right, as a battle between good and evil. Right. You sell millions of newspapers like that. Right. The only problem is that that, is not the truth. If you look at the media in the Middle East, which are really also important in this situation, they're all owned by Saudi Arabia. I mean, they own newspapers, <laughs> TV stations, internet producers, all over the place. The only thing they don't own of some size is Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is independent, and that's why they are blockading Qatar. Mm -hmm. They are talking about terrorism and all that. But what it's all about is stopping Al Jazeera as the last large independent producer of news which are not Saudi-owned. As we do uh, conclude and, and come to solutions, within liberal democracies, has political correctness been a, a problem? And let me give you uh, context here. If you have a hate preacher, or if you have no transparency to understand where the funding for terror is coming from, there is a sort of uh, reluctance to speak out because we're politically correct. And actually, uh, should it not be that our elected officials say, no, we want to know where this money's coming from. Uh, and if someone's preaching, hey, sorry, that person isn't welcome uh, on these shores. Well, if you take the specific case of Norway, you know, if you put uh, limitations on the mosques, you have to do the same thing with the churches. Let's mm. take, for example, uh, the state funding. We are actually funding mosques in, in Norway with huge amounts of money. Why? Because every religion, according to the laws, should have the funding. So... If you want to stop that, we also have to stop, according to the law, the funding of the church. It's, it's more than political correctness. It's, it's politically almost impossible to stop all of this. What, uh, as two experts, would you say to the householder, to the people here, we can do on a daily basis when we either read the press or the way we conduct our lives? What's one thing that we can do 
to begin thinking about or combating this terror funding that we've talked about? Well, uh, what I miss the most is, as you are saying, an open discussion. You know, mm. the political correctness is putting a lid on, on many debates which are really getting more and more necessary. So what we need now is to see that we cannot tolerate the intolerant. The intolerant mm. people, if we just let them have their say, then gradually tolerance will disappear. Right. So our, our tolerance can be too much. As you are saying, we should say, stop, this is enough. But that requires a very open discussion where you, you put the name on the animal, you know, what, which elephant is in the room and where is it? And I, I don't see that coming uh, very soon in, in our countries. Of course, it's getting close. I mean, people are more open. But when you look back in the 1980s, 90s, actually the discussion was more open than it yeah. was now. Now it's, it's very difficult. And even in the universities, you see mm -hmm. the lid being put on various discussions, also in other contexts. So it's a difficult situation at the moment. I agree. I think we were more open during the Cold War than we are today. During the Cold War, if you were in the West and you wanted to say something positive about communists, you were allowed to do that. Even if, of course, that was the enemy. I also think that we were more informed during the Cold War than we are today. With all this social media, with all this freedom, with all these you know, cheap flights that you can hop on and go everywhere, we know much less than we did at that time. And the information circulated much more. People knew about what each other were writing, <clears throat> what they were doing, but today, I find that there is a growing isolation. That you know, even the experts, uh, even you know, the people that are working on certain fields, uh, are increasingly isolated because there is not that flow of ideas and information, and everybody is so focused upon building up its own profile. Again, you know, the narcissism. There is no ideology. We're going beyond all of that. Mm. So unless, you know, we wake up and we realize uh, that we're really losing uh, the fundamental element uh, of who we are, which is being together, being a society, I think, you know, we're heading for, you know, really hard times. Carl, Larissa, thank you both very much for your time. Thank you.